Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the National Wireless Safety Alliance's webinar, Become an NWSA Practical Examiner. My name is Joel Oliva and work closely with the National Wireless Safety Alliance and will be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is the third of a three-part webinar series covering the benefits and requirements of becoming an NWSA Practical Examiner. Practical examiners play a critical role in the NWSA ecosystem and becoming one will allow you to administer NWSA practical exams to candidates seeking certification. If you have any questions regarding the information presented during today's webinar, please feel free to contact NWSA. We will have that contact information available at the end of today's presentation. We will also have a question and answer session as time allows at the end of the presentation. You may submit your questions to me during the webinar via the question chat box. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Clint Cook. Clint is NWSA's Practical Examiner Accreditation Program Instructor. As a PEAP workshop instructor, Clint brings his experience as a tower hand, foreman, manager, and safety director to the table. Clint served on the Telecommunications Tower Technician Task Force, which played a key role in developing the TTT1 and TTT2 certification programs. Clint also serves as the chairman of NWSA's Practical Exam Management Committee. With that, I'll turn things over to Clint. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is, again, yeah, our third webinar covering some different things. Last time we covered how to set up your test site, um, and now we're going to talk about how one becomes a practical examiner. Uh, we've done a number of workshops over the last year and a half, and I believe we're up to around 100 practical examiners across the country, uh, and it's definitely been a busy summer ramping up, so room for more practical examiners. So today, we're going to talk about a number of different things related to becoming a practical examiner. We're going to talk about exactly what a practical examiner is, what the prerequisites are to become a PE, how you become a PE, how you conduct the practical exams as a practical examiner, what the pre and post exam responsibilities are of the practical examiner, uh, how you maintain your practical examiner accreditation, and then also how the audit program works for practical exams. Before we dive into that, though, let's talk about why you might want to become a practical examiner. There's a lot of different reasons to become a practical examiner. One is to just help meet the need of testing for NWSA candidates. As the program continues to grow across the country, more and more folks are needing exams in their area, and growing the practical exam pool is an important part of doing that. Uh, you can also offer exams in-house or third party. So it can be to people outside your organization or within your own company. Uh, for in-house training, obviously that'll give you greater scheduling flexibility and is more cost effective to certifying uh, all your crews. For third party, you can offer those exams to outside entities. Uh, you can get extra value added to that and you can charge what you'd like to uh, offer those fees to your competitors or subcontractors or just the industry in a whole. And then just the industry recognition. Uh, the NWSA is gaining recognition across the industry and uh, being a practical examiner is is a good thing for you uh, as part of that industry. So what exactly is a practical examiner? Uh, there's a lot of different thoughts out there, but basically what a PE is, is an unbiased reporter of a candidate's performance during the practical exam. Uh, it's easily, you know, to use the words like trainer or training, but we've got to remember it's just certification. Uh, and as much as possible, we want our examiners just to be unbiased reporters. So again, a PE is not a trainer. PEs should not coach candidates during an exam. Essentially, they should be a robot there checking their score sheets, correct or incorrect, uh, as unbiased as possible. The main roles for a practical examiner are to ensure that the proper test site is completed and to also do the site report. So they verify that everything's set up properly before beginning an exam. They also read the verbatim instructions, then record the performance on the score sheet. So as much as possible, they're just following a template that's the same between all exams. After the exam, they also submit all the exam documentation to the NWSA office. So they're an important piece in the whole chain of certification. What are some of the practical examiner prerequisites? Well, first, you need to be certified uh, as both a 
Triple T1 and Triple T2 in the NWSA. So I've done both your written and practical exams. Uh, you should possess expert knowledge of tower climbing, fall protection, and rigging techniques. Uh, so a lot of experience, at least three years experience generally in the industry, uh, so that you really understand how the tower industry works and the school skills and abilities needed to, to do well there. You should also have a complete mastery of all the exam tasks uh, so as to be able to identify incorrect score marks. Uh, there's lots of intricacies, intricacies to the exam, and so being able to complete the task to a high level uh, is important to be able to mark things correctly. Be able to accurately record a candidate's performance without bias. So a practical examiner needs to be able to take off whatever hat they may wear in the industry, whether they're a trainer or a safety director or a construction manager, whatever that might be, and just put on their NWSA hat uh, and record all candidates without bias, no matter who they are. Uh, they also must have a high degree of professionalism. Uh, it's important for the integrity of the, of the program and the uh, NWSA as a whole that our practical examiners have a high degree of professionalism. So different steps to becoming a TE. First, become certified at the TT1 and TT2 levels. So complete both CBT and both practical exams uh, in either order uh, before applying to come to a workshop. Uh, for the remainder of 2018, we will be holding practical exams just prior to the remaining workshops. Uh, so as long as you've done your written, you can do your practicals. Uh, second, submit an application and your resume to attend a three-day practical examiner accreditation workshop. So once you're Triple T1 and Triple T2 certified, uh, you can apply to a workshop. Uh, it's $750 for the three-day workshop, uh, and the current offerings are on the website. Uh, also, companies are able to hold closed workshops if they have enough internal personnel needing PE accreditation. We've done a number of closed workshops uh, for folks with different regional offices and wanting to set up multiple test sites, uh, and it can be a very efficient way for, for companies to do that. Step three, once you've been accepted into the three-day PEEP workshop, uh, you need to successfully complete it. Throughout that three-day workshop, we do a number of different things to build good examiners. Uh, we go through a program and exam orientation for the NWSA. Uh, we look at the different certification and accreditation requirements for tower technicians as well as practical examiners. Uh, we go through the test site setup and verification process using the site reports. Uh, we go through the candidate check-in procedures. We talk about how we administer the exams using the verbatim instructions how we accurately document performance using score sheets. Uh, and then we also do a series of exercises which are known as inter-examiner reliability exercises. Uh, these are exercises we do to make sure that examiners are scoring performances the same way uh, to increase reliability and validity in the practical examiner process. Uh, it's a very important part of the workshop that really helps to calibrate all the different PEs uh, to the same scoring and reporting. Uh, after that, we do a written exam uh, as part of the accreditation process, uh, and then a workshop debrief and a document submission. Uh, so we go through all the steps done in a practical exam multiple times to ensure mileage and familiarity with all the steps. Uh, it's just like a language, you need to use it a bunch to, to offer a good, smooth exam. Uh, after successful completion of the three-day workshop, you will be sent a PE kit, uh, we'll have, which will have a number of things in it. Uh, first and foremost, your practical examiner accreditation card with your unique PE number. Uh, you'll get a set of the laminated verbatim instructions, a uh, set of score sheets, uh, exam task instructions, as well as a thin radius measuring tool and copies of the caps and voice manuals and other related documentation, things like that. You'll notice that a number of those things are confidential. Uh, as a practical examiner, you're privy to a lot of information that should just be for your eyes only. Uh, it's set up that way so that the practical examiners are the only ones who can see things like instructions and score sheets, because uh, essentially those would have the answers on them if a candidate were to get those. So there's a number of things as a PE you need to keep close to your chest. Uh, some of these PE kit materials are those. So. How are practical exams conducted? 
Well, first of all, candidates wait in a separate area from testing. Your testing area should be free from distractions and spectators. Uh, then each candidate will go through a check-in process uh, in which the practical examiner will check their government ID, inspect their PPE, uh, get their candidate application, and take a headshot for their certification card. Uh, once the candidate has been checked in, the practical examiner will read the safety briefing and the exam rules, at which time the candidate will uh, sign the score sheet acknowledging that safety briefing and rules. Uh, then the practical examiner will start the clock and begin reading the verbatim instructions for each task. Candidates will then complete each task, indicating they are done with each one. Uh, meanwhile, the practical examiner accurately records the candidate performance on the score sheet for each task. Once the candidate has performed all of the exam tasks in the allotted time, uh, there's a short exam wrap up. Examiners are not able to tell candidates whether they pass or not. All the score sheets are processed by the NWSA office. So the practical examiner cannot say whether or not the candidate passed the practical exam. Uh, that's up to the office to issue that. Different responsibilities for the practical examiner. Uh, First off, they need to communicate with test site coordinators before the exams. So there's two important roles in the practical exam system, the test site coordinator and the practical examiner. Oftentimes those might be the same person, uh, but they may not be. So it's important for the PE and the TSC to coordinate to make sure everything's taken care of for setting up the exam. The PE also needs to order score sheets. So they're the only people that can handle score sheets. Uh, and then prep their PE materials, make sure they have all the proper stuff with them. The practical examiner also needs to submit intent to test on the NWSA website. Uh, that's an online submission form, needs to be done at least 48 hours prior to testing. Uh, that helps to schedule audits and just let us know when exams are being held. The PE also needs to conduct a pre-exam site inspection as well as complete the site report before any exams start. Uh, it's nice to do that the day before, just to make sure everything is covered. The practical examiner then follows the candidate check-in steps, verifying the ID and filling in the score sheet candidate info, collecting the candidate application with the payment info, inspect the candidate's PPE to ensure proper working condition, and capture a digital photo of the candidate for the certification card. So again, there's a number of administrative things that the PE needs to do to make sure that the office has everything they, they need certification cards. Uh, once they've got that, they need to administer the exams in accordance with the proper procedures, reading the intro, safety briefing, and exam rules, having the candidate sign the score sheet, reading the verbatim instructions exactly as written, that's why they're called verbatim instructions. Uh, they may clarify if needed, uh, just without coaching the candidate. Record the time after each task and inform the candidate of how much time is remaining after each task. Accurately record the candidate performance without bias. And then ensuring the score sheet is complete and signed. All documentation needs to be complete and signed uh, for the office to be able to process it. So it's up to the practical examiner to make sure everything is fully completed. After the exam, uh, it's up to the practical examiner to submit the following exam documentation within 10 days of the exam date. Uh, it's great if they can get that quicker. Uh, turnaround time is always a hot topic. Nobody likes waiting to hear if they get pass or fail on an exam. So the faster you can get it in, that's great. It needs to be within 10 days though. Uh, everything is an electronic submission now. Uh, scan and email PDF documents to the NWSA at nws-a.org. That's the email address for all exam submissions. So first off is the exam summary form, uh, which is essentially a cover sheet checklist to make sure everything's included for the exam submission. Copies of your site reports for whatever types of exams you are doing, your candidate applications, your score sheets, and candidate photos, which are easily identifiable with their name. Uh, once you send all that in, your PE will receive an email confirmation of submission receipt. Score sheets should be destroyed or securely archived. It's up to practical examiners what they do with those, but they must maintain control of them all the time. Uh, you can't show them to other candidates and things like that. Uh, destroying them is great once you know they've been received, uh, but you can hold on to them if you like just securely. 
Uh, there's a lot of different forms and resources available to practical examiners uh, on the NWSA website. Things like the practical exam application, the candidate's handbook, site reports, uh, how to request the use of the NWSA logo once you're a practical examiner. Uh, you can be listed on the practical examiner directory webpage of the website if you'd like to be open for hire as a practical examiner. Uh, pass fail report forms as well as score report forms are all available to practical examiners on the website. Once you've got your practical examiner accreditation status, uh, there are a couple steps you need to do to maintain that uh, in an active status. You need to be in that active status to be giving exams. So to maintain your active status, you need to administer at least one triple T1 or triple T2 exam in a 12 month period. So just giving one exam a year, either one will maintain your status as an accredited practical examiner. If you do not give an exam in 12 months, you'll need to do a one day refresher workshop. Uh, if you don't give an exam in two years, 24 months, you need to redo a full three day PEEP workshop. Uh, it's important to use these skills as an examiner to maintain a good exam environment. Uh, so one exam a year is, is the bare minimum. Uh, you need to maintain your own triple T1 and triple T2 certification status. So you must maintain your own certification uh, in order to hold your accreditation. So whenever those two certifications lapse, you'll need to recertify uh, in order to maintain practical examiner accreditation. Uh, you may not administer exams while in the inactive or suspended status. So you need to maintain all those pieces to be giving exams in active status. Uh, accreditation review and investigation. So there's a number of things you need to do as a practical examiner. Uh, to maintain good status. Uh, some things that you may do that would cause review or possible investigation would be three or more late or incomplete score sheet submissions. Uh, it's very difficult for the office to turn around score sheets when things aren't complete, so it's important for the practical examiner to make sure everything is done properly. Uh, any reports or evidence of examiner bias or coaching? Uh, obviously, there's potentials for conflicts of interest, uh, and it's important that we avoid those as practical examiners. So any, re any reports or evidence of those uh, may trigger a review. Mishandling of confidential exam documents. So anytime that a PE were to lose control of their score sheet, uh, anything like that, verbatim instructions, confidential info would be reason for looking into it. Uh, reviews may result in retraining, suspension, or revocation. Uh, so it's important for the integrity of the practical exam program uh, that everybody's doing things as they should. So you may need to retrain, suspend, or revocate based on the situation. Uh, we will also be conducting practical exam audits. Uh, this is just to maintain the integrity of the program. Uh, in order to maintain a high level of program integrity, the NWSA will conduct exam audits in a couple different formats. Uh, we will have unannounced exam and test site audits. Uh, that's why we have the intent to test submitted so that if we need to, we can send somebody out to make sure the test site is set up correctly and that the practical examiner is administering the exams properly. Uh, we also look at data reviews from practical examiners and test sites uh, to see pass rates and things like that if they're uh, holding up to the industry standard. We also will perform secret shopper candidate office audits of open test sites. Uh, that's a good tool to just uh, really get a feel for how different sites are running the exams and make sure they're properly done. These audits will focus on proper test site setup, exam administration, examiner performance, and post-exam submissions. Uh, so just a general look at how the exams are being administered at different locations by different examiners. Very important for program integrity, uh, as we all know. So just to review the steps to becoming a practical examiner. First, becoming triple T1 and triple T certified, determining if you meet the PE prerequisites, checking the website for the available three-day workshops, attending and completing a three-day workshop, receiving your PE kit and score sheets, and then coordinating with a test site coordinator to schedule exams in approved, approved test sites. Uh, we do have two more workshops uh, that have just been scheduled this year. Uh, we have one October 1st through the 5th, uh, hosted by Vertical Limit in Minneapolis. We have another one October 22nd through the 26th, hosted by Pacific Safety Solutions in Vista, California. 
Uh, these two workshops will also have the option to do practical exams the two days before. So if you have not had the opportunity to do your practical exams yet, but have your written exams done, you can do them the Monday, Tuesday prior to the workshop starting. Uh, this will be the last opportunity, opportunity to do those exams prior. Uh, starting in 2019, all workshop candidates must be fully Triple T1 and Triple T2 certified prior to applying for the workshop. So this is a great opportunity to uh, do both your practical exams and the workshops if you meet the prerequisites. So take a look at those two workshops and uh, you can sign up if you like. Uh, here's some different points of contact. Uh, myself, if you have some practical exam or accreditation programs, uh, as well as Aaron and Janiel deal with practical exams. Jacqueline does a lot of the scoring and things like that. Uh, and then Shelly, you all know from the NWSA. So that is the end of the presentation there. We've got some time now to uh, answer some questions. Joel? Great. Thanks, Clint. Uh, great job. Um, so yeah, as, as Clint mentioned, we'll now take an opportunity to answer uh, any questions that you might have that have that uh, that I've received through the through the chat box. I've gotten a few so far, but certainly those on uh, that have others that, that that have come up, please I, I certainly encourage you to submit them. So first up, our first question is um, uh, the question is when do they find out if they have passed? I, I'm guessing they mean the candidates. When will the candidates find out if they have passed or failed the examination? Yeah, so that's a super common question uh, and something we address in the workshops. Obviously, every candidate wants to know whether or not they pass. Uh, on the verbatim instructions, we'll tell them that they should expect the results within 12 business days. So that's highly dependent on the examiner getting their results in within that first 10-day window so the office can return them. But that's the, uh, that's the turnaround time, 12 days uh, from the exam date to get their results. Great, thanks. Okay, the next question we have is, um, is, a co is a combination of a T2 practical and the PEEP workshop a total of three days or four days? So if all you need to do is your Triple T2 practical, uh, it would just be four days. You could schedule those exams on Monday or Tuesday, depending on you know when you got registered, what slots were open. Um, and then, yeah, just do your exams on one of the days previous, and then the three-day workshop Wednesday through Friday. Uh, it, it's possible to do both your T1 and T2 in one day, uh, so it's possible to do the whole thing Tuesday through Friday if it's scheduled right. Great. All right, the next question we have is, uh, can I test, as a, as a practical examiner, can I test people who work for my company or for my competition? Yes, um, so that's a unique thing. Uh, it was a hot topic of discussion for sure within the task force, but it was decided to meet the industry need. Uh, the examiners must be able to examine not only outside people, but their own in-house employees. So you're available to examine your own employees or anybody on the outside, uh, subcontractors, other people in your area, as well as to go to other areas as a practical examiner for hire uh, and do practical exams at any approved test site. Great. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, do I have to be a practical examiner for both the TTT1 and the TTT2, or can I just get it for the TTT1? It's, you must be for two, for both. Uh, the practical examiner can give, or give either exam, uh, but currently, you cannot just give the one. So the workshop is set up to be able to give both exams, and you must be certified at both levels to enter the practical examiner program. Great. Okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, what is the cost of, uh, sorry, what is the cost for the TTT1 and the TTT2? The cost of the exam, I assume. Um, so the practical exam, each exam has a hundred dollar fee. Um, so depending on where you're taking that, uh, another organization might have their own fee on top of that if it's a third party testing system. Uh, if you do the workshop uh, with the practical exams just prior, then that's all you pay is the hundred dollar per exam fee. Uh, the written exams are 174, I believe, each. Uh, practical exams are a hundred dollars each. Okay, good. 
Um, next is, does the website differentiate between practical examiners for hire versus uh, accredited practical examiners? And how can I tell? The only list of practical examiners on the website, on the website are those that have requested to be listed on the directory. Uh, so anybody listed there has agreed to be open for hire, so you can contact them and bring them to your facility. There are other practical examiners, uh, but everybody on that list has chosen to be on the directory. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Clint. So those are all the questions I've received so far. I'll give everyone just another 10 seconds. And that looks like that's it. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Clint. I appreciate uh, all, all your uh, answers to those questions. And thanks, everyone, for submitting those questions. Uh, if we did not get to your question or if you have a question that comes up uh, after the fact, please feel free to follow up uh, with, uh, with any of the contacts listed on the screen. Uh, depending on your question, it, it can get routed to a different person. But if you don't know where to go, uh, you can simply use the NWSA at nws-a.org uh, email account, and we'll get it routed to the right person. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, please stay tuned for information about upcoming webinars, which we'll uh, be announcing in the next few weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And we'll be making a recording of this webinar available as well uh, for, those, uh, for any of those who are unable to attend today. Uh, so, and for more information, you, uh, you'll be able to find uh, that information and additional webinars on the NWSA website. So, uh, thanks everyone for your time today, and have a wonderful day.